you can still trade it with someone who's willing to give you something of value for it. I've done that um, even even in this day and age. So it's something that can be a, a private form of wealth the more, uh, the more digital we go with things. You're listening to Alternative Investor Mastermind, where we do a deep dive on alternative investment opportunities and the lifestyle it can create. Join Jack Krupe as he presents actionable tips and tricks in doing passive real estate away from mainstream strategies. Go beyond the usual fix and flips and try less explored yet rewarding investing ventures from multifamily properties, mobile homes to cryptocurrencies. Do not miss this opportunity to escape traditional assets and finally create wealth without Wall Street. Now your host, Jack. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Alternative Investor Mastermind. Got a great guest for you today, Michael Aries. Mike, thanks, Michael, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, no problem, Jack. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Great, great. So uh, we're going to talk about investing in precious metals and gold today. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. I, every once in a while, I you know, will listen to uh, you know, a certain podcaster, Peter Schiff, and get <laughs> into this panic mode about uh, gold and silver. So I don't think we've ever really talked about this in the show and they might, I guess in a way, maybe he's a competitor, maybe he's not, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm really interested uh, in this topic as someone who's dabbled in all sorts of alternative investments. So um, if you don't mind, just tell everybody your story, how uh, kind of how you got into, you know, mm -hmm. into precious metals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jack. Yeah. It's a, it's a interesting thing um, having it. It's really something everyone can benefit from owning. Uh, for myself, um, I work for a company called McIlvaney Precious Metals. They're a 50 year old family owned company. Uh, I've been working for them for over a dozen years, but really since growing up, since being a kid, uh, my family got their newsletter. They got Don McIlvaney's newsletter. We've just been aware of, you know, the, the trends happening in the world and some of the reasons for owning gold and silver. So we We've always invested in that. I've been buying gold and silver for myself for 25 years or more. So, you know, I help people do it now, but I've been following these markets and buying it for myself for a long time. And really, it's a matter of, um, you know, having it for the right reasons, knowing what advantages it, it offers and uh, just sort of, you know, filling that gap or filling that bucket, so to speak. It's one thing, you know, it's one tool in the toolbox, but um, it's got, got some unique advantages. And really with um, just inflation and the way the dollar gets printed out of thin air, everyone that uses the dollar should have some gold. It really is for everyone to some degree. Um, but I've, I've enjoyed, you know, following the, uh, the markets, alternative investing, and just the geopolitical and economic trends for a long, long time. And just seeing um, kind of that, the, the use that gold has in, uh, um, you know, a non-traditional way of investing. Wow. So this company started 50 years ago. I'm just doing the math. I mean, that sounds like it's basically right when the U.S. went off the gold standard, um, basically since, since then, since the, the start of the this, this fiat currency mayhem we've been in for the last 50 years. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Our founder, Don McIlvaney, started it in 72. So really right after we ultimately went off the gold standard, he could see the writing on the wall back then that, yeah, this isn't going to be good for the dollar or for people's savings. So he uh, wanted folks to get gold and uh, just been doing that for a long time. His son, David McIlvaney, has since taken over. So it's this intergenerational dynamic we have going on and long term relationships with our clients. We've, we've you know, helped folks for multiple decades and helped their families. So, um, yeah, it's really been all, all about that, helping prote people protect their wealth. Just seeing that, you know, right from going off the gold standard. Oh, this this is not going to be good. And it's taken a long time to play out. But, you know, our company had a lot of foresight and kind of seeing the trend well before it happened. So, yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is probably a simple question, but you know, I, I've, I think it, you know, would be helpful. Um, what's the difference between buying gold through say your company versus just buying the GLD, uh, you know, exchange traded fund on, on E-Trade or, or, you know, TD Ameritrade, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, Jack. A big difference because what we do is physical precious metals. We deal in getting people coins and bars and actually something you can hold in your hand. Uh, whereas GLD, any of the ETFs, you really don't own any gold. You own a claim on some gold that is supposed to be there, but it's still a paper asset. And when we're talking about precious metals, we want to actually own the gold because gold has intrinsic value in and of itself. It doesn't depend on anyone else to have value. And if you hold it yourself, you don't, aren't, aren't, you aren't depending on anyone else to keep it safe or to give you that value. If you have it, 
um, it, it is what it is. You've got that gold. So there's a place for speculating with uh, um, ETFs and mining shares if you're trying to um, grow your portfolio and you're speculating on price and you're going in and out of the market. But foundationally, you want to have some physical precious metals that you always hang on to um, for the you know different reasons. Inflation hedge, you know, chaos hedge, all the different things we can talk about. But just a certain amount of physical gold that um, you know doesn't doesn't disappear. It doesn't go away. It's not a number on a computer screen. Okay, you did mention precious metals. Other than gold, like what are the other, um, you know, I guess uh, top metals that you deal in or that you may recommend yeah. somebody take a look at? Yeah, re really, we would stick with gold and silver for the most part. You can also look at platinum and palladium as precious metals, but they have a much bigger industrial component, platinum and palladium, um, and a little bit of a precious metals component. So you can have a small exposure to platinum and palladium and even just trade them back and forth as they switch places, whichever one is taking the lead. Uh, we'll do that with gold and silver as well. But gold and silver are the monetary metals. They are, the, they are what we can call real money. And they're the ones you invest in to um, hedge against the, the dollar losing value. And I, I guess that's the thing is we would define gold and silver as money and money has to be a store of value. So if you have a dollar in your wallet and you say, oh, I've got money in my wallet, it's not money. It's a currency, but it's not money. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree. Um, I'm down here in Puerto Rico and there's a mm -hmm. ton of, uh, you know, crypto enthusiasts down here. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts, you know, as someone who, you know, sort of shares at least the opinions on a dollar, where, 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 what are your thoughts on crypto and how to, how to crypto and gold play together? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they've got some uh, similar strengths, um, but they're also different in a lot of ways. So with gold being physical, that's something that that's always going to be there no matter what the government does, the computer system does. It's not so easy to, um, you know, to track it or follow it or if the electricity goes down and not not be able to access it. Um, you know, so, so, you know, something like Bitcoin is interesting. It is also limited in supply. Um, it can be in some ways a store of value, even though the price has been very volatile the last few years. Um, but gold has a 5,000 year track record of being a store of value. So there's, there's advantages to crypto. There's reasons to trade it and own it, but I wouldn't pick one over the other. They both have different advantages. Gold is that physical asset, again, that's always been around through human history, always been money through every uh, empire and every currency that has ever come and gone. We, we go right back to gold until something else comes along. So that's that's the one with the, the security and, and Bitcoin can have different advantages being digital and still in some ways being a store of value or an alternative currency, but um, not a replacement for gold. They have, it's, it's physical and you have, you have, have some of each really. Great answer, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask about, I, I've heard here and there about market manipulation in, in the gold mm -hmm. market. I don't really understand it at all. Can you, can you speak to that at all on, you know, is, is, do, you, do you think the market is being manipulated at times? Is gold being held down by, I don't know, the deep state or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting when talking about market manipulation, because you can get into this conspiracy theory realm, but at the same time, all you got to do is look at the Fed. The Fed comes out and says what they may or may not do in a couple of months, and the market trades on that. And they don't even have to do anything. So in a lot of ways, yeah, market manipulation is built into our whole system from the top down. They're going to give some guidance and say, well, we might be doing this and, you know, try to direct the market where they want it to go. So anything else below that, yeah, is, is pretty obvious and pretty easy. Um, but there are some telltale signs of market manipulation when we can see, you know, trading, big lots of trading in, in uh, low liquidity markets. So say on a Sunday night, um, some entity, some bank, whatever, dumps a ton of contracts of gold and silver. I mean, that's not a smart way to trade. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You're making the price go down. You're getting the worst price possible. So either they're terrible traders or they purposely are wanting to push the price down to affect everyone else's perception of it. So these things happen. Um, the the regulators don't try to stop it it's really in the best interest of the government for gold to go down or to not go up as fast because gold's a warning signal that your currency is bad so they're they're not going to go after someone that's breaking the rules with trading because they benefit too but at the same time gold has gone from 250 dollars an ounce at the beginning of this bull market 20 years ago to now over two thousand dollars an ounce so manipulation hasn't kept it 
you know, capped, it's gone up eight times in price. What would it be if there hadn't been that? And I, I think it'll still, you know, catch up to a fair value compared to all the money we've printed despite the manipulation. But we've certainly seen it. It's been proven. There were some traders at uh, Deutsche Bank from Germany that, uh, you know, they had their text messages. They proved that they were spoofing the market. And a few low level guys, um, you know, get get punished for it. JP Morgan, same thing, you know, low level traders get punished for it or the bank gets a fine. And for them, a billion dollar fine is just the cost of doing business. So it happens, um, hasn't totally kept capped the price, you know, price has still gone up, but it's part of the reality of our world. They they do uh, mess with prices and, and probably should be a lot higher by now. So, Michael, you mentioned fair value, and uh, you know we're this will probably be out a couple of weeks. So we're uh, it's February nineteenth, just for mm -hmm. for anyone listening. Um, where, where do you what do you think? Um, I guess two part question. Like, what mm -hmm. what do you think the fair value is? You know, for gold compared to where what the spot price is now. And then, mm -hmm. I'd also be curious on the sort of the gold and silver tracker on mm -hmm. sort of the you know how they compare to each other and, mm -hmm. and where where you see that currently. Yeah, yeah, really, really good question, Jack, as far as where it could go and then the relationship between gold and silver, how they relate. And and kind of going back to an earlier question you had um, that I didn't answer on what differentiates us from other companies where you can buy gold. Part of it is the advice and the strategy. We're, we're trying to help people do this the best way, and we look for ways to maximize your gold and silver investment, uh, such as trading between gold and silver when the relationship between them changes. And one will tend to outpace another at different times. So that that kind of goes to your second question, but are we differentiate ourselves by advising people and doing the best strategy with precious metals? So where could they go? What's the implied value? Um, we can make a guess at that. I mean, in the 1970s, we had a bull market in gold. It went from $40 an ounce to $850 an ounce. And there were some guys back then that made a pretty close guess to where it could go by just looking at the money supply. They would look at, you know, whether it was M2 or M3, they would look at a certain measure of the, the monetary supply that was out there and the available gold um, that, that was there in reserve. And they got a pretty close guess of where that bull market ended up going. And if we do the same thing today, just relative to all the amount of money that's been printed, especially since COVID, we added tens of trillions of dollars. If we do the same kind of thing today, or if we just look at uh, reserves that the, the Federal uh, Reserve has, the, the central bank, what they have, and look at the amount of gold that's out there, you can come up with an implied value of anywhere from ten to $15,000 an ounce. So gold's $2,000 an ounce. If it does what it has done in the past in today's dollars, it can potentially go to ten or fifteen thousand. And silver at the same rate, um, you know, the the ratio between gold and silver um, fluctuates generally between forty to one and eighty to one. So think about this, Jack. Uh, you know, when silver has done really well and it's up in price, it only takes forty ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold. When it's undervalued, when it's lagging behind gold like it is right now. It's at 90. It takes 90 ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold. So we'd say buy some silver. And when when it outperforms for a time and then it only takes 40 ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold, we'll then trade some of it for gold and get some free gold. But with that relationship, you know, historically, when we were on the gold standard, it was 15 to one. Now, we, we may or may not get back there again, but at the end of the last bull market, you know, I mentioned in the 1970s, when that ended in 1980, you know what the ratio got down to? You know how low it got? What? Hello. It briefly got down to 17 to 1. So so you're looking at, let's say gold goes to $10,000 an ounce briefly and catches up to the money supply. Well, silver's at 90 to 1 now. Let's say on a big bull market move, it does get down to 20 to 1 again. Well, then, you know, then what are you looking at? $500 silver? That might be, that might be pretty crazy, but also possible for a short time before it comes down to a new normal. Uh, silver going over $100 an ounce is probably a no-brainer. That, that's probably child's play at this point for where we're at in this, uh, this you know, monetary experiment. So whether it's a couple years from now, five years from now, that's probably easy. And then we'll see how high they both actually end up going. But looking at the monetary supply, the implied value, it's many times higher than where they're at now. So it's it's going to be fascinating to see where where things go because I don't see a way you know it, it does it, unless there's a it's going to take a crisis for 
mm-hmm. the government to ever run a surplus, I think, again. I mean, I think we had <laughs> one year in the Clinton administration. And what did they say in the government? Never let a good crisis go to waste. But yeah. <laughs> I don't think either side has you know any wherewithal to be fiscally responsible. So we're just going to just continue to run the debt as long as we can get away with it. Now, I don't know if you follow a guy named Peter Zihan. Uh, mm-hmm. He at least gives me some confidence that just – you know, the, this BRICS currency, and there's really not a lot of other options and that, you know, maybe, maybe just inflation is sort of our hidden tax to the rest of the world for using the dollars and we just kind of get away with, and we're just going to monetize the debt. But, you know, the smart, the smart ones are going to be the ones that are hedged. Mm-hmm. And uh, it sounds like gold is a great way to, gold and silver is a great way to hedge. Yeah, it, it is because it's always going to have its value. It's never going to go to zero. It's always going to go up relative to the more money we print. And it's it's physical and limited in supply. It's, you know, we're talking about printing money out of thin air, creating inflation because there's more dollars out there. Uh, gold is very limited in supply. So that's why it maintains its value. I mean, there's there's enough for every person on the planet, I think to have like three quarters of an ounce of gold, maybe at the most, not even an ounce. So you talk about some investor that, you know, goes and buys 20 ounces of gold uh, just to put away. There's a lot of people that are never going to see gold. It's just, it's very limited in supply. So that's something that, that will, will help it keep value. And, and when you're talking about, you know, where, where the system could go from here, it is going to be fascinating to see. It's, you know, we can't run an experiment like this forever of unlimited debt, unlimited money creation. It's never worked before. We've gotten away with it for quite a long time, but now inflation has been showing up enough that the fed had to start raising interest rates in 2022. They couldn't just keep them low forever. So now, yeah, how bad does it get? When do we see a a real reckoning of, uh, of all the debt we can't pay back? And, you know, when you're joking about running a surplus, I mean, we're so far from that, right now and there's so much debt that would have to be paid back and so much liquidity yeah i don't i don't even see how that's possible so what yeah what is the end game how do we get out of this i think it's 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 going to be something not fun and and something we do have to protect value with and having tangible assets is one way yeah yeah and and honestly you know one of my you know one of my fears as far as a recession goes is you know when you're running a trillion dollar deficit i mean a lot of that does go to defense to, to things that actually do create jobs. So, you know, if we, if we all of a sudden just had to, you know, do austerity like Greece or whatever, I, I think it would cause a mega recession because really a lot of the money we're really paying to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where I get scared is, uh, you know, just a major, you know, 2008 type crisis just from just all that money being pulled out of the system. So I don't, I don't yeah. think that would be a good thing either. I think inflation is the lesser of two evils. Yeah, and, and we probably are going to have to have a lot of inflation because look at Social Security and Medicare. Like, they can't just stop those payments. Social Security is going to be technically bankrupt in less than 10 years. Um, they're certainly not going to stop sending those payments to all those people. They can't. That that would just there's, – there's no – there's no justification for that. So they're just going to keep printing money and keep sending all the social security payments and all the welfare spending and all of the defense spending. It's just going to keep going. So yeah, I think we're very likely to have a very inflationary outcome and scenario as they keep printing um, to, to fund all these things that are already baked into the cake. So that's where you, that's where you see, you know, um, gold and other assets uh, that are limited in supply go up like that. Yeah, I, mean, I spent two weeks in Argentina uh, this September, and they have 150 percent annual inflation. And mm-hmm. um, you know, we do have some benefits of being the reserve currency. But Argentina, there's all this talk about maybe they dollarized, but you know, for the most part, they were the smart money down there was already dollarized. Uh, mm-hmm. People would actually pay a premium and convert their money to dollars at double what the official rate was and save in dollars. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people that were working online were getting paid in U.S. dollars. Uh, a yeah. restaurateur I knew basically had to adjust his payroll once a week. I mean, it's, it's, it's when, when inflation gets out of control, it's not a, yeah. it's not a great place to be, but people do adapt. Um, so hope, hope, hopefully, uh, hopefully we, we navigate it and it's somewhat of a, a soft landing and especially those in the know can, can hedge properly. Um, I want to ask about, you know, how does it actually work? I know you could buy a gold bar, you could buy, I've heard about some of the, you know, the maple leaf coins, the, you know, what, what are the, yeah, and then do do they store them at you? Do you guys have like a you know a bunker where it can be stored, or do people take delivery and put them in the safe in their house? Kind of talk me through the logistics. 
Yeah, yeah. So logistics wise, you know, people can send us payment um, and we take a personal check or a bank wire, then we can lock in a purchase and either ship it to them or send it to storage. Um, there are a variety of good uh, coins and bars to get um, from a variety of mints. We stick with just the best quality, the most reputable and what we would call bullion coins. So something that's a low premium. It's it's valued for its gold content, not for being rare or collectible. There's there's certain times and and certain ways where collectible coins make sense and there's a right way to do it and then there's also a way to do it where you overpay or get the wrong type of thing so we, we advise people when it comes to anything uh, specifically collectible but otherwise stick with low premium bullion so uh, Canadian maple leaf coins one ounce maple leaves from the Royal Canadian Mint one ounce gold eagles from the US Mint or just one ounce bars there's a handful of mints in the US and in Switzerland that make good one ounce gold bars so anything like that is easy to get um, if someone wants it at home if they're comfortable with that or have a safe to put it in we can ship it to them and it's fully insured and signature required um, if someone doesn't want it at home we can store it at a depository uh, we don't store it ourselves and you usually don't want your broker to store your gold for you. you don't want to mix those things we've seen that go bad with other companies we're just dealing in advising and um, acquiring it we're not going to store it for anyone but there is a, uh, a third party depository on the east coast we work with that has been around for decades and they're very reputable so there's always a way to you know either hold it or store it and you can buy precious metals through an IRA so if you have a retirement account want to get it out of the market uh, you can still have it in physical precious metals metals and not have to withdraw it and pay the taxes on it. And in that case, it is stored at a depository. You can't take it at home, um, but it's still another way to get access to something, something physical, something limited in supply. Yeah, that's a very, very good point on the IRAs. And I know, uh, you know, there's a prominent tax attorney, John Heyer, who's also down here in Puerto Rico. And I think he, he did some content on a specific case where someone with an IRA or a solo 401k was trying to self custody and it was a bad you know, bad outcome for them. So yeah. uh, definitely yeah, yeah. use a custodian. Yeah, the IRS doesn't tend to like that. There needs to be a, a third party that's holding your gold and, and some separation between you and your retirement assets because they want to make sure that it's accounted for when you have to pay the taxes on it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I was looking back. I think it was, uh, I'm trying to think of which book it was, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I guess during the Great Depression, there was a point where the government basically Made, tried to make everyone turn in their gold and then devalue the currency 20 or 30%. Can you, I don't know enough to really talk about it, but are you familiar with that just from your extensive gold yeah. knowledge? <laughs> yeah, I'm very familiar. I've, I've read some history on that, read some good books on that. It's a very interesting time. So essentially what happened is um, in 1933, Roosevelt was elected to his first of his four terms and his treasury secretary, I can't remember the guy's name, his treasury secretary was the one that came up with the idea. So we had been in a Great Depression, you know, for 10 plus years. And so his, um, well, not quite that long. It had been a few years. The Great Depression continued beyond that, um, but it had been, you know, three or four years and and his idea was to take us off the gold standard because back then we were on a gold standard so you could have a one ounce gold coin and it was the same as a twenty dollar bill gold was twenty dollars an ounce so you could take your one ounce gold coin spend it like it was a twenty dollar bill and that was a lot of money back then i mean you know the smaller like one dollar five dollar gold coins would have been a little more spendable but essentially it was you could use gold as money um actually trade it um, ongoing, you take it to the bank or whatever. So during the Great Depression, when um, everyone wants to hoard their savings, they're not sure what's going to happen. What do they do? They take their gold. They don't take cash. They go to the bank and they turn in whatever cash they have or they empty their bank account and they just take the gold coins. So everyone's hanging on to these gold coins. The bank doesn't have any um, uh, capital, any liquidity where they can loan out money. So uh, FDR's Treasury, Treasury Secretary, his idea is we need to go off the gold standard. We need to be able to let the Federal Reserve print money unhindered, have the banks loan out money, not be stuck tied to this little bit of gold that everyone's holding on to that we, we can't get. So that's what they did. They said, okay, no more using gold as money. It's illegal to own. Everyone turn it in and you'll get some cash for it. And also it, there was a big patriotic push. It was like, hey, this is the American thing to do. We're trying to get the economy going. Certainly the populace was a lot more patriotic back then than they are now. So they lined up and turned in their gold. And then once the government had enough, they revalued it from $20 to $35 an ounce. 
They just unilaterally said, okay, this is what we'll pay for gold now. After you've turned it in and gotten $20 for it, now they say, no, now gold's worth $35 an ounce. So that was essentially a, a 60% devaluation in the dollar overnight. So no more gold. We can only use cash. And now it's worth that much less. So yeah, it was basically taking us off the gold standard so they could print all the money they wanted. And that's what they've been doing for the last hundred years is printing money out of thin air. Yeah, it's it's crazy. But I, mean, I lived through 2008. I have some scars from it. And I, I really yeah. I spend about 10 to 20 percent of my time just trying to plan for, you know, mm -hmm. how do you hedge? How do you stay ahead of, of the next the next crisis? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, again, I, I agree with you. I don't think people would line up at this point to uh, mm -mm. <laughs> to turn things in. And and frankly, I'm kind of surprised that the government has sort of adopted crypto the way the way they have, you know, they're certainly jumping into regulated, but it's almost, it almost seems like they may have co-opted the crypto market as well. And that, you know, there's going to be winners and losers and those that have assets and that are smart money are going to be able to hedge, but it's mm -hmm. just, it's sort of the hidden inflation now. Um, you know, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on, mm -hmm. you know, how, how bad things could get, or if you think it's going to be somewhat of a soft landing and just sort of this, mm -hmm. you know, hidden inflation over yeah. the next 10, 20 years. You know, a couple points I think of when you mentioned 2008 and, and how do we survive the next one, uh, you know, gold and silver were a great hedge for that because they dropped initially uh, in the just the kind of a sell off in the market, the panic to cash. They dropped initially in 2008. They recovered way sooner than stocks did. And then for the next three years, gold tripled and silver went up five times. So they, they do respond well to crises like that. Um, and then when you're talking about the government going towards crypto, man, that's that's a scary thing because they they have, I think they've made it clear that they want to move towards some kind of digital version of our dollar, some kind of crypto version of our dollar. And they're going to regulate or tax all the rest of them. And really, it's it's all about control. The, the one thing the government wants more of is control. And if they have uh, a digital version of our dollar, well, then you can do anything with it. If, if our currency is a, a piece of software that they can program, they can do anything. I mean, China's already a few years ahead of this, and they've been working on that. And the implications are scary. It's, oh, you can't buy that, or, oh, you're late on this payment. We're going to take some money from you, or um, even geotagging it. So like, all right, your money will work within a 10-mile radius from your home. Um, and, and no further. So these, those are those are extreme implications, but that's what's possible. That's what ultimately would be coming down the road from a digital currency. So that's another thing really even to, to protect from. It might be something we have to use to some extent, but, you know, any amount of gold you have or, or real tangible assets, that's something that's outside of that trackable system. That's something that can be private um, private wealth for you. So, and I, and I know you're a big real estate guy and, and there's advantages to real estate where you've got cash flow. Uh, but with gold, it's a kind of tangible asset where it's small and portable and very liquid. So there's, you know, they're both tangible assets. They have different advantages. So they complement each other. So you've got your real estate. People always need a place to live or a place to use and you get cash flow. Gold, I mean, you know, you can put that in your pocket, run away with it, just like um, the, the Jewish people did in World War II. Take their paintings, take their gold, go to Switzerland, you know, come back when it's all over. They've got their wealth. And trading it, you still can use it as money. We've talked about it as being money as far as the definition of money, like holding value. And we used to be on a gold standard where we used it as a currency, but you can still do that today. You can still trade it with someone who's willing to give you something of value for it. I've done that um, even even in this day and age. So it's something that can be a, a private form of wealth the more, uh, the more digital we go with things. Sure. I think there's actually some custodians, at least I know one of them's offshore, so I don't know... Uh... Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, what, what it is in, in the U.S., but I, I think there are some custodians that will allow you to lend your gold to other people and charge interest mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. as well. So it's not impossible to, to even earn some yield. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you yep. can speak to that at all, if you're familiar with some of the custodians mm -hmm. you work with. Yeah, you know, honestly, we, 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 don't, we don't get into, into that a lot simply because we like to have our gold as, as savings right now, not loaned out. We want to, we want to use it. Same thing with like, you know, having a, a credit card where you can, um, you know, spend your, your gold holdings. For me personally, I want it to be a savings. I want to accumulate as many ounces as I can. And I want it to be unencumbered, no third party risk. 
um, it's all mine and I can get to it. So uh, we, we don't get into the, the interesting. I've seen the other programs out there and that might be a fine thing for someone that has a certain amount and they want some of it earning interest and, and loaning it out. But for me, it's like it's it's savings and I want to accumulate ounces and then see how this plays out because we've talked about it. We, we don't know how this is going to work, how bad it's going to be. Um, you know, and that's gold's just sort of a safety net, no matter no matter what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, to your point before about uh, just you know, in times of crisis, I mean, there was a deep freeze in Texas for a couple of days where the you know the, the power grid almost went out. Um, mm-hmm. Puerto Rico and during Hurricane uh, uh, Hurricane Maria, I mean, I, I was not here at that time, but I have friends that were here, and and you know there was the power was out for the entire island, and mm-hmm. you know most people don't carry that much cash on them too, so. Um, you know, I have a friend that was, was fortunate. There was relief flights coming in and, uh, between gold and some savings, they jumped on mm-hmm. a jet that was a relief flight just to get to Florida. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, having some, some gold where, you know, a couple coins this big can be mm-hmm. what, you know, five, 10, $15,000. And it's just, mm-hmm. you know, something you can keep in your pocket. If, you know, if there's a you know, crisis, it doesn't need to be this big geopolitical thing. It could be just a natural disaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting. That's a question that comes up a lot, even like a small silver coin, like this is a half ounce silver coin, you know, that can be used for smaller stuff. Um, but that, that happens. I mean, I've, I've paid workers in silver when I talked to them, found out they were interested in metals and, you know, just paid them in silver for something they did for me, didn't have to pay them in cash. And I've heard of people that, uh, um, I knew a guy and he had a friend that went to a gas station up in Canada and their internet provider had gone down. And so his friend actually went to the gas station owner and gave him silver coins and filled up um, his tank, even though credit card machines weren't working. So even even in this day and age, you can still trade it for value. And people ask me about bartering uh, with precious metals all the time. And it doesn't have to be that grid down collapse, you know, nobody's uh, nothing's working kind of, kind of situation. I mean, you can still do it now and it's just a, a private transfer of value. So, um, you know, it's because gold and silver, they have that value locked up in and of themselves. It took a lot of energy and manpower to get that out of the ground and make that coin. You can't just go find one lying around and, and then use it. It, it has a lot of value built into it that you have to, to give in order to obtain one. Absolutely. So if someone's looking to get started, um, mm-hmm. you know, what, what's, uh, you know, never you other than maybe buying a random ten dollar coin off the internet or something like that if someone really wants to build a position like what what what, what advice or what steps should someone take mm-hmm. to you know if they're if they're looking to like build a real position you know as mm-hmm. part of a balanced portfolio in precious metals yeah yeah well first of all call me folks are welcome to call me and get a free consultation and i try to advise because it's case by case everyone's got a different set of circumstances different um vehicles in their portfolio that they can use. So, you know, really have to do a one-on-one consultation. But uh, generally, you know, I would say put 20 to 25 percent of your portfolio in precious metals. You know, some people would say 5 percent. I'd say, yeah, that's not enough. At least 10 percent, just as a bare minimum that if you want something that's going to bail you out. But I'd say 20 to 25 percent is even better. Um, So just have, you know, whatever amount of your portfolio that you know, you know, you're comfortable that you know that amount you're never going to lose. Whatever helps you sleep at night, you know, put that much into precious metals. And then we'll talk about, you know, whether it's taking delivery, whether it's an IRA, depending on what people have. Um, and right now, maybe doing more silver than gold and what percentage that should be and and how to uh, adjust that over time to get free ounces. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we'll go over how the process works and what the long term strategy is and and uh, yeah, see what what works best for a particular person because everyone's a little different. That, that's, that's really great advice. Um, mm-hmm. So tell everyone how to, uh, how to get a hold of you. Yeah, probably the best way is just my direct phone number. Um, it's uh, area code 970-459-4611. And you can probably put it in the notes or put it on the screen, but it's 970-459-4611. Uh, give me a call, shoot me a text at that number, leave me a voicemail, and uh, we'll connect and, and talk about uh, the best way to do it. That, that's great. We'll certainly put it in the show notes and, uh, you know, we'll certainly also uh, in, include all of the, any of your social media as well. So uh, we've got a mm-hmm. decent following on, on LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. Apparently we have a TikTok account now too. 
Uh, <laughs> nice. Don't do any crazy dance moves, but uh, yeah, we, we, we put the content in anywhere that anywhere we might be able to help educate somebody. So, Michael, thank you Excellent. so much for coming on the show. Uh, yeah. A lot of great knowledge. I learned a few things myself. Well, thank you for having me, Jack. It was a lot of fun, and I appreciate you uh, addressing this topic and the conversation. Uh, it was really fun, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll have you on again sometime, especially as the uh, you know geopolitical events unfold. It was a great conversation. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jack. Well, you have a good day. Take care. Thank you. You as well. That's all for this episode of Alternative Investor Mastermind. Now that you know the many alternative opportunities out there all up for the taking, you can finally become ultra-connected and ultra-wealthy. Get more valuable advice from the experts by subscribing to the show at alternativeinvestormastermind.com. Become a winner in the world of passive investing today in alternative investment strategies. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.